Hello, and welcome to day two of PWSA USA's 2021 Virtual Family Convention. For those who joined us yesterday, welcome back. For those that are new today, we are so excited to have you here. Again, we are thrilled. We have over 1,500 registrants for this year's convention. My name is Paige Rivard, and I'm the CEO of PWSA USA and mom to Jake, an 11-year-old little boy with prader willi syndrome. As I mentioned yesterday, it's been an amazing week so far. Today, we start our convention, or I guess Tuesday, we started our convention with our Professional Providers Conference. Wednesday and Thursday, we heard from presentations on current state and promising research from the Medical Scientific Conference. And yesterday, we kicked off our family convention. There have been so many great presentations and information to take in. Just a reminder, most of these sessions are being recorded and will be available on our website soon. We have a great lineup for you today, um, a broad range of topics from a discussion with the pharmaceutical industry, insight into GI issues, several breakout sharing sessions, and more. To start us off this morning, Dr. David Agarwal will provide a condensed recap of the two-day medical scientific conference, and we will end our day with Dr. Jennifer Miller providing a PWS year in review presentation. I would again like to thank all of our sponsors, specifically our Lighthouse sponsors, Levo Therapeutics and Seleno Therapeutics. It is because of them we can bring this convention to you for free. Please make sure you visit all of our sponsors and exhibitors in the attendee hub. I would also like to again thank our staff, board of directors, and volunteers who have worked so hard over the past several months to bring this convention to you. Most importantly, I want to thank you, our families. Everything we do on a daily basis is for you. I have a few quick housekeeping items. Please remember to fill out your surveys at the end of each session. We truly value your feedback and want to use that to enhance future um, conventions. I also want to remind everyone we will be announcing the 50-50 raffle winner during the closing session, so be sure to um, join the closing session. We are also looking forward to seeing all of our families who signed up tonight for bingo. We have families, friends, group homes. It's going to be a lot of fun, um, great time filled with fun prizes and superhero sightings. So we're looking forward to closing out conference with our bingo night. Now I would like to introduce to you Dr. David Agarwal, who will provide us with the recap from Wednesday and Thursday's Medical Scientific Conference. David is a vascular and interventional radiologist specializing in the treatment of liver cancer, liver diseases, and solid organ transplant intervention at the Indiana University School of Medicine. David is a member of the PWSA USA Clinical Advisory Board, a former PWSA board member, and he's married to Janice, a neurodevelopmentally trained pediatric physical therapist who, if you saw her presentation yesterday, was excellent, and it will be recorded, so you can see that again later on our website. The Agrawals have two sons, Alex, 21, and Sam, age 20. They live on a small farm in Indiana, and David's free time is spent on house and farm chores, supporting Special Olympics, catching up with missed episodes of sci-fi TV, and occasional travel. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to David. Hi, good morning. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you. Okay, uh, I'm going to minimize that uh, that screen sharing screen and then here we go. Everybody, welcome. My name is David Agarwal. Uh, as Paige said, I'm an uh, interventional radiologist working in Indianapolis. Uh, I am excited to be able to summarize uh, the the good data that we got during our Wednesday and Thursday presentations. And it's going to be a fun and exciting ride. I'm going to try to make this as least boring as I can because the, the information is sometimes a little bit dry, but I think some of it's very useful in every, not just in venture research, but in everyday day-to-day -day applications and taking care of our young adults, our old adults, our, our children with prader willi syndrome. Um, the moderators for our conference were Jim, Jim Loker out of Bronson in Kalamazoo, 
Anne Mazzardo, uh, Kansas City at UK at KUMC, and Buddy Pojo, Poggi. Uh, I want to thank our scientific advisory board committee, Jim and Buddy, Christy, who invited me, Stacy and Paige, who have been instrumental in setting this up, and all the IT wizards in the background that are making this conference possible. And, you know, welcome to back to back Agarwal talks. Janice closed out the sessions yesterday with her talk on sensory integration and a sensory diet for just modifying behavior. And this is going to be a starting session today. So you guys can get the, the Agarwals twice in a row. My job today is to summarize, um, you know, 14 hours of, it was phrased as an adrenaline, adrenaline rush of information, um, and to translate that in a straightforward, easy to digest fashion in the things that we can use every day. Please remember that if you have any questions about the talk, please use our Q&A session, use, start a chat. Uh, those questions will be forwarded to me and I'll do my best to answer. I may not be able to get down into the weeds to answer very nitty gritty questions, but I'll do my best to try. And for those of you who are as little OCD as I am, or as my son Alex is, um, I, I'm gonna put a handout of these slides onto the website, the conference site, so that everything you see on my slides is gonna be available to you so you don't have to write notes down. Uh, just focus on absorbing information, kicking back, relaxing, and enjoy that second cup of coffee. Um, we're going to go over two keynote sessions and four scientific sessions. Each of them were about an hour. Uh, they were moderated by Jim and Anne. Then we're going to shift into shorter abstract presentations. These are moderated by Anne and Buddy. And these were all very patient-centered, data-centered, national and international studies. And to quote Dr. Poggi, he he, we emphasize the biopsychosocial model that's needed to promote, promote excellent care. So. Getting into things, we had two keynote speakers. Deepan Singh out of Maimonides is our first keynote speaker on Wednesday morning. He focused on the, the psychiatrics manifestations of Prader-Willi syndrome. And the key thing to look at is when things change. You know, what we need to expect is normalcy. If we don't see normalcy, look for something that's changing. So this normal timeline that our adults with young children with Prader Willi have day to day, it can change. So if you see a change in behavior, that change in behavior may be something that needs to be evaluated. So changes David, from normal are important. Yes. Uh, we are not seeing your slides. So can you try to reshare your screen again? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to display settings. Um, I no longer have the option to share screen on my screen. Do you see anything? What do you see? Uh, right now we're not seeing, try, try one more time there. Um, I'm gonna go back to my first slide. I'm gonna minimize this, this may look messy. Uh, I'm in my PowerPoint. So it looks like I'm not even in any kind of a Zoom. I'm just looking at my PowerPoint. I'm going to try to log back in again. Is that what I have to do? No. Um, did you minimize your Zoom meeting? So you should have a little blue camera icon at the bottom of your screen. I do see a Zoom. Okay, click on that. There's my scare, there's my screen share. I'm going back to screen share one. Excellent. Awesome. So I have to I have to leave all the stuff. Oh, so yeah, I did minimize the people thing. So I wasn't staring at people all the way. <laughs> all right. My apologies, everybody. Uh, this now should be my first slide where we introduce Jim Loker, Ann Manzardo, Buddy Poggi. Here are my thank yous, uh, the back-to-back -back Agarwal talks, the two keynote sessions, and um, the presentations. Here's our first data slide. This is Dr. Dr. Singh's presentation on diagnosing psychiatric manifestations of prader willi syndrome. He was our first of two, two keynote speakers. We had a keynote speaker on Wednesday morning, another one on Thursday. Deepan focused on what to expect with prader willi syndrome. And emphasize that a normal timeline, when you're talking about a person who may have a psychiatric change, understanding that change from baseline is very important. So if you see something that's different, figure it out. 
and realize that when we're trying to figure it out, there are docs in the system, most of us, that really only know what was taught in medical school. And we studied for a test. We know the bullet points about prader willi syndrome. We know about the loss of function of chromosome 15Q. We know about the details, but we don't know a lot. It's up to you, parents and caregivers, to educate us as medical providers to figure out what you see is different because we're looking at it from a test point of view and you're looking at it from a day-to-day -day life point of view. And then realize that there are not enough providers in of psychiatric services available to help us understand and take care of these issues. So there are oftentimes primary care physicians, primary care caregivers, non-mental health providers that must step up, learn and treat. Um, we talked during the presentation, we learned about behavioral features, hyperphagia, sometimes aggression and impulsivity. Are these all related? And I think the answer is yes. We have to kind of tease out these individual pieces. We looked at developmental versus intellectual disabilities, and we understand that our people with prader willi syndromes oftentimes have verbal skills that are more developed than their cognitive processing. So I have Alex, who's 21. He speaks as if he's 18 or 20, but cognitively, he may be still processing at 12. Um, and it's a psych out. You know, people are looking at our, our adults with Prader Willi syndrome and expecting more based on their physical appearance, not understanding what's happening cognitively behind the scene. Um, and then also realize that Prader Willi syndromes do not neatly fit into anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder categories used for the general population. We have to look uh, beyond that and maybe combine some of these different things. I learned during the talk about something called a response perseveration the inappropriate repetition of a particular response in the absence or cessation of reward. You know, this is that over and over talk about what's going on in Alex's head or anybody else's head. And is this anxiety? Is this impulsivity? Is this compulsivity? Or is it an overlap? So these are important things to kind of tease out. And the healthcare professionals that are dealing with this can look at this. And then to think about what our options for treating are. We learned that there are different psychiatric medications, all different categories. They all have side effects. They all have benefits and they should be used appropriately. Dr. Singh is doing research. He's enrolling currently in a clinical trial that's involving a medication called guafenosine XR and its effect on compulsivity. So realize that in the handout that you'll be able to download later, his telephone number, if you're interested in enrolling in clinical trials, um, and the contact number for the team at Maimonides is here as well. So to sum up, uh, Dr. Singh wanted us to look at changes from a normal baseline. Understand that if you see something in your person with Prader Willi that's different, you're probably the best barometer to figure that out and bring that person to the system to get some help. Uh, he also, during the question and answer session, reminded us that autism spectrum disorder is actually more common than Prader-Willi syndrome, that symptoms of autism may impair function more than symptoms of Prader-Willi. So if you have a diagnosis or meet criteria for autism spectrum disorder, there may be more resources available to you and take advantage of that to get appropriate medical care. And he tied into our, one of our later sessions about sleep apnea, uh, realizing that many of the symptoms that we see, anxiety, impulsivity, or compulsivity, um, they often can come from a, untreated sleep apnea. So that was our first talk. We learned a lot and you know, realized that our people with Prader Willi are on a spectrum. They'll show some or all or none of these characteristics and we have to figure out what to do next. So Dr. Miller was our second session speech and she talked about a year, about a year in review with updates of clinical care, treatment and clinical trials. It's always fun listening to Jennifer. She puts things together so well and gives us the key bullet points that we need to work day to day. She started with dietary recommendations, reviewing nutritional phases, and then you know realizing that at each different phase, there's a different level of anxiety about food changes and that affects a person's function. We are really learning more about a person's insulin response now. And this is really important to avoid foods that taste sweet, even if there are no calories. That starting taste of sweet in the mouth triggers an endocrine response to the body. And we need to kind of avoid that amped up insulin system to, de to improve our bodily functions day to day. So if you're eating fruit, add something like nuts to go with whole fruits. Remember that whole fruits, not juices, 
whole foods with skins and fibers are healthier. And we're always trying to balance sugar content and insulin response. You know, we're going back to suggesting things like whole food Mediterranean diets with healthy and saturated fats, little or no processed foods, whole fruits, not juice, milk or water. And we all understand it's super hard to change the behavior of individuals with prader willi syndrome, especially to get them away from sweet tasting stuff, um, but it's worthwhile. And if you start that process when a, a person's young, you can start good habits early and then carry them through. And sometimes you can explain to a person with prader willi why it's important to stop taking sweet stuff and make that a part of a new routine. We also talked about other medical issues, sexuality, Hormone levels do not correlate with sex drive. Realize that if we have a normal capacity for affection, our people with Potter Willie do want sexual or marital relationships. They want to have their own sexual identities. And it's not related to hormone levels, which may be off. It's still part of normal growing up. We talked about sleep studies and realizing that sleep studies in, may show apnea in infants, but that's not really going to be an obstructive sleep apnea because it's just too early. That's going to be a central sleep apnea. That's going to be due to hypotonia, low tone, and growth hormone, even with infants, is going to help that. Later on in life, uh, you know, closer to a year or a year and a half, when adenoids and tonsils develop, you have to watch out for the obstructive sleep apnea issues, but there's a mix. But overall, there's still a benefit from growth hormone. We learned a little bit about narcolepsy manifesting during eating. Um, that's something we'll have to kind of watch. And it, is, it happens a little bit more frequently than people think. And then GI issues, especially delayed gastric emptying, um, super important. And uh, working on you know, what could be a problem like a basoar that builds up when vegetable matter builds up inside the stomach. Um, that's basically undigested food sitting in the stomach and blocking the entry of more food. So with respect to clinical trials, we had some mixed results from intranasal oxytocin up front, but now we've got two good trials with carbitocin and DCCR, both showing significant results, especially when you look at the data prior to COVID. And we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, actually, we should do this now, I guess, to get it out of the way. COVID changed our perspective on questionnaires so that when our caregivers and our parents were filling things out about patients enrolled in trials with Prader Willi, after March 1st, the stress, the anxiety, and the issues related to COVID affected the questionnaires uh, relating to efficacy of carbitocin and DCCR. So if you go back and take out the data after March 1st, you see these positive results where things actually worked, both with carbitocin and DCCR, and the questionnaires show very successful responses. So what's coming up next? Uh, these things called triple reuptake inhibitors affecting norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. Uh, things affecting gut biome. We know that when bacteria are missing, uh, they can affect how lean you are. So leaner people have a different gut biome, different bacteria in their intestines. And probiotic studies are showing that they can, we can decrease insulin levels with the good bacteria in the gut, and that can improve body weight. Uh, Pitolacin is undergoing a phase two study for narcolepsy. Oleoserine is uh, being evaluated for its effect on osteoporosis. And then we have intranasal oxytocin that's still being evaluated further for infant changes, uh, sucking and bonding and adult changes in hyperphagia. So there's a lot of good stuff in the pipeline coming through. And um, we just need to stay tuned as the FDA starts to work to approve these things so we can get them out clinically and use them. Our third clinical session uh, on, to, on Wednesday was talking about pulmonary issues. And Amy Rivano, she actually taped her talk because on the 24th, she had a baby. And I think that was much more important. Uh, Rajan came through uh, around, I think it was 11 o'clock in the morning in Houston time. Uh, Arjun is, is his name. And I got a cute little picture from Jim Loker. So successful birth. And uh, we were just very happy that Amy could present on pulmonary issues on Wednesday as well. She talked about the effect of, from the pulmonary standpoint, of hypothalamic dysfunction, appetite dysregulation, food seeking behaviors, you know, a, a change in the shape of a person's face. And a lot of these issues that are related to pulmonary are from low tone. So we need to reflect, just first start in the very simple things with pulmonary issues. Is there a poor cough? Can a person, do you see a person choking when eating? Uh, and you have to get that evaluated because there may not be symptoms that you will see right off the bat, 
but a poor or chronic cough and respiratory infections can lead to other issues down the line, especially in infants. And it's often asymptomatic. Um, in our older folks with Prader Willi, we see fast eating and poor chewing that can manifest with swallowing issues and cause more choking. And that may be silent. So you have to kind of watch for that. The big thing on her talk is to watch for sleep disordered breathing. This affects up to 53% of kids and 41% of adults. And it's again, often is asymptomatic, even though you have a positive sleep study, it can be aggravated by scoliosis and it makes a difference. You know, if you do not sleep well, it affects your function, it affects your speech, it affects your growth. So we have to look at these things and understand them. Central sleep apnea is when you can't generate that breath and it's um, just not getting effective sleep. And I took some notes on that, but there are some more things in Amy's talk that I missed, but it has to be distinguished from obstructive sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea is something mechanical that is blocking the flow of air and central sleep apnea is the mechanism that underlines breathing. So I learned about interfaces, different things that are like masks that are used for adults, but can be used for kids off label. Um, nasal masks and nasal pillows are different terms that you'll see with sleep evaluations. And you also have these bulky full face masks that are a little bit more complex to use. Um, terms like CPAP, which is continuous pressure coming in through a mask to help a person breathe better, or bi-level positive airway pressure, or auto positive phrases. You know, these are different terms that you can look at in how to best find out how to work on a combination of central and obstructive sleep apnea. From the mechanical side, if something is blocking the flow of air, you try to get rid of the blockage. So you take out adenoids, you take out tonsils, you can add pressure. Um, you have to control weight and all those things make a difference on how well a person gets air into their body. There are adjunctive therapies, there are medications that can be taken in as sprays or steroids, or we can watch to see over six months, is there a difference over time and repeat a sleep test to see if a weight change makes a difference, for instance. If there is something at the level of the skeleton, a craniofacial issue, surgical issues can make a difference to expand um, the, the sinuses or the maxillary tissue, the structures to get air to go through better. You can position a body better to move air better. And then for central sleep apnea, uh, non-invasive ventilation, CPAP and BiPAP with backup rates, there are all these different techniques that these very smart people in the pulmonary SART can put together to help you. And we then have to deal with the challenges of getting someone to wear a mask effectively or um, help that sleep get better so that your daytime is better as well. What if we don't do this? We can see growth failure, daytime sleepiness, cognitive or behavioral issues, learning problems, aggressive behavior, and longer term, pulmonary hypertension. And that means that if you're not breathing well, then your heart has to work harder to get blood into the lungs and your blood pressure goes up. So it's a lung driven effect on your heart to figure that can make things go worse down the line. That's a longer term effect, but we have to check for that. So general treatments. Look at growth hormone, it improves body composition. Monitor food, limit intake, watch behavior. We know that pharmacotherapy and surgical bypass doesn't really work well with prader willi syndrome. So we have to work on the things that we can control, limiting food and behavior modification. Um, ask if there's a good cough. You know, a simple screening test is, is a person coughing effectively to clear their airway? And last, to make sure there's a good airway to, move, to mobilize secretions, to move air, reduce aspiration, um, to screen, identify, and sleep to sleep and treat sleep disorder breathing. And that concept of sleep disorder breathing is something that can affect you not just at nighttime, but at daytime. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, but it's part of a, a multidisciplinary evaluation to see how we can look at a person with Prader Willi from all different levels and bring breathing into it, making things more effective. Okay. Uh, on, on the next day, we had a keynote speaker, Tony Holland. Uh, brought us into the international world. Uh, the International Prader Willi Syndrome Association is, and I spelled that backwards, didn't I? Um, the International Prader Willi Syndrome Association works based out of the United Kingdom. It works in Europe, Asia, Australia, and it coordinates with so many people outside of the United States, but with the United States as well, to bring Prader Willi care to everybody. It's an amazing group of people. And if you're looking for an organization to jump into and help, they are fantastic. Uh, at a very high level, they coordinate with Rare Diseases International, with uh, Nord, with Eurodis, with WHO, um, and they're supporting people globally. 
we're working on diagnosis, information in different languages, uh, testing with uh, genetic testing that's not available everywhere, but you can send things to them and they will test for free. Um, international conferences are being coordinated. There's, we did just one in Cuba. We're doing the next one in Ireland in 2022. Uh, IPSWO deals with the challenges of global issues, with communication, with administration. They set up good practices. They're doing nonstop research and dealing with social policies and interacting with multi-level governments. They're involved with the innovative delivery of global healthcare, genetics and telemedicine, remote monitoring. You can imagine what we're doing as a Zoom conference here in the States, they're doing across the world with you know, dealing with multiple time zones and the issues that are coming up that way. They are dealing with translational technologies, taking technology and delivering it to real world stuff. Um, they did a COVID survey that, because there was a question out there that everyone was going to ask that does COVID affect people with Prader Willi syndrome more than other people? Is a diagnosis of COVID, is it being delayed in our, in our people with Prader Willi? Is it being missed? And then what happens when a person with Prader Willi gets a COVID infection? Is the outcome going to be poor? And they looked for me for a year. Uh, just finishing up, uh, looking at a study from 17 countries, they had 72 people responding to their COVID study, different ages, different BMIs, a lot with comorbidities, and quite honestly, there were fewer cases reported than expected. And the outcomes were much better than expected, even to the point where we kind of wondered, is, is there something going on at the genetic level that makes it, that makes it a person with Prader Willi less susceptible to the downstream effects from COVID. So is there a protective effect from having that chromosomal change? And that's something that's been looked at by Dr. Butler as well. And it, you know, it may be that our people with Prader Willi are less affected by COVID than we are. You know, the study, you know, we only got 72 people responding. Um, it may not be representative of everything going on in the world. And we actually do know a small number of deaths. Uh, of people with Prader Willi syndrome. These are people almost entirely with serious pre existing conditions. We also know that these 72 people may not have had a confirmed COVID test. Um, and, you know, it's not representative of the world. We have a lot of people that are responding or coming from our high income countries in Europe. So, Tony's conclusions maintain good health. And, you know, we should look further. Do we have uh, is our population at decreased risk for viral infection? We should look at why and look at the genetic thing behind all this. Um, Tony talked about the ECHO program. This is a, supported by a grant from Pfizer that is looking at best practices and how we can get information from that we know is good out to the rest of the world. He talked about amplification, taking technology and sending it out, best practices, case-based learning, database management, using Zoom like this to democratize knowledge and send stuff that we know works to people all across the world. You know, everyone's always teaching, everyone's always learning. We don't know everything, but we can share information that we can get. Uh, there are currently four projects in the ECHO program working on leadership, health, Latin American professional care providers, and they're all sessions that are very well attended in each of the different areas. The last thing Tony talked about was the, the mental health initiatives that are coming through on the international level using this broad WHO definition that I think is a lot better than the definition of mental health that we use here in the States. You know, it's more than the absence of a mental disorder. To be in good mental health, you have to have the ability to maintain a dynamic state of equilibrium and maintain harmony, uh, be able to recognize, express, and modulate emotions to cope with adverse events. And quite honestly, not it's not just something that Prado, people with Prado Willi cannot do very well on a day-to-day -day basis. Almost all of us have some relative disequilibrium in our ability to deal with these things. At a higher level, IPSO deals with uh, the research community to advance knowledge and develop safe and effective interventions. And you know what care environments work. They're the best standard stuff that comes out of IPSO is amazing. And these social care initiatives are fantastic as well. And that transitioned really well into our discussion uh, about learning how the systems are set up in Denmark and in Germany. Uh, Suzanne Blichfeld uh, from Roskilde talked about how the Prader Willi program is set up uh, to cover 5.6 million people in Denmark. And within that population, there are 135 people with Prader-Willi syndrome. 80 of these people are over the age of 18. And we learned that the system set up in Denmark is to get people as independent as they can be. It's typical for people in Denmark to move out of their family homes at age 18 or 20. And they go into a specialized home 
that is run by run privately or by the government municipalities and they are successful models for doing things that work these are homes that each have a small flat with one or two rooms and a bathroom they have a, a one to one almost a one to one ratio caregiver and our the staff have many years of experience and they're focused on handling challenging behaviors so what does it come down to right they're going to ask it's usually three square meals three coffee breaks with fruit or bread daily or weekly weights weight gain and stomach problems actually occur not at the houses, but after the residents come back from visiting family. So you can imagine that when you go from a regulated environment with good schedules back to home and where it's less regulated, um, visiting family is quite an issue that introduces weight gain and stomach problems. So in these homes, people with prodigal are never alone in the kitchen. There are regulations that make that work. They focus on physical activity. They do house and garden work. They have workshops with many activities. Nothing is paid and realize that everything here is paid by the government. Uh, a person with a disability has a pension and that pension is used to cover the cost of rent, food, cleaning, laundry. There's no fee for running the home. That's set up by the, by the municipality. So there are still some challenges. You know, within Denmark, the income tax is 50%. So there is a lot of money coming from the general population to subsidize government programs. And even with that happening, some of these municipalities are not interested in building new homes for Prada Willie. And that's it. there's a cost involved, right? So what Suzanne focused on was the emphasis that to, for change to take place, you need to have an advocate in the system. And only when you can have someone in authority who understands the problem and can actually allocate funds to this will something happen? So that just emphasizes to us as advocates for our people of Prada Willie that we have to find partners within government and private industry to do things on our own because government by itself is not gonna make it work. They've got budgetary issues all by themselves. So we know from the Denmark model that trying to live in a home that doesn't specialize with Prada Willie, uh, perhaps a home that's closer to family or with, you know, in, or maybe in a family home when both parents are working, that doesn't really work well. Um, less regulated, it's often associated with weight gain. And another other issue that's being addressed right now in Denmark is that as residents get older, parents get older. They can do less when a person with Prada Willie comes to visit, they're not as active, they don't have as much of a higher level. So, you know, we're looking at an aging population and that's not something when they started in Denmark, no one really lived beyond 20. And now we've got people that are living older and older and we have to deal with these issues. So what happens in Denmark? The, the social pension that a person gets when they have a disability changes when a person gets older. At age 67, the amount of government funding given to that person decreases. It goes to the normal, quote, old age pension that everybody gets. There's less financial support. So there's less financial support for a regulated environment. You can't really, you may not be able to stay in those homes that show good control of weight. Um, so, it, that's an issue and it changes at age 67 and now you've got people trying to figure out what to do at that level. In Denmark, there are only two centers for rare diseases, uh, growth hormones covered. Um, there are other costs in medical care that have to be covered by patients and families, uh, but most is covered by the state. And what I thought was interesting with their you know, government run system for healthcare, everyone with probably has an ID card that can be presented that shows what some of the medical issues are when you go into the healthcare system. When you go into the healthcare system, a computer screen pops up that says this person has Prader Willi, has a high pain threshold. Um, if they're vomiting, that can be life threatening because they normally don't vomit. Uh, they have poor body temperature regulation, abnormal reactions to anesthesia, and there's a contact number for high level care. So anybody who comes in the system, that computer screen pops up to make things safe. So Germany, very similar. Uh, the philosophy that Norbert talked about was reaching for the highest level of knowledge, developing training program for people with Prader Willi syndrome, but also develop training program for staff. So he talked about supporting individuality because everybody is in a spectrum. We're looking at some people who are able to function very independently and don't need a lot of assistance, but need some day-to-day -day monitoring to make sure they remain safe. And some people are a little bit more involved and may need a little bit more external support. So he, he put up a slide that showed this balance of providing external supervision and allowing self-control so a person can make decisions by themselves. And it was super important in, to be transparent in all communications, to help a person understand where 
the supervision is coming from and why. And, you know, also for the systems to provide experiences to be successful so that people can be proud of their achievements, but also experience with a failure. You can't just, you know, give them a certificate of achievement for everything. You have to let people fail every now and then so they can understand that um, what they did can be altered and they can learn from those experiences. Similar to Denmark and Germany, the houses are financed by government. The, these uh, are then allocated to private companies that can have foundation and private partner support. So the homes are, are businesses. And for children, there are three specialized group homes. Uh, for adults, there are currently 16 homes. And there are also people with prader willis syndrome that are in non-dedicated structures uh, that are actually still very effective. Uh, the focus is on handling challenging behavior. And similar to Denmark, there are, here there are 150 hours of training that a person who is going to be involved in one of these homes has to go through to be able to work with prader willi syndrome and everything from behavior analysis to verbal de-escalation to nutrition management to sensory integration to group supervision. Um, you know, it's, it's a very detailed program. Uh, and, you know, this is that high level of uh, best practices that are being used and can be exported elsewhere. Uh, what I learned from the model in Germany and from Norbert's talk was that they tried different models. They tried having six people with prader willi syndrome in one flat or um, a total of 12 people on one floor. And they then they tried to figure out what the level of supervision is going to be. Uh, and when they built these homes together, they are now changing to smaller unit homes. So there may be an apartment with two people with prader willi syndrome and then an external person somewhere else in the building. And still having that same food control, but giving a person a little bit more independence and a little bit more uh, self-control. Um, in terms of staffing, you know, it's similar to here. You need to have at least two staff per house because uh, at one point there may be a conflict and that conflict may draw one staff away and that you still need to have the supervision um, to maintain the program and, and do that with the other staff involved. You know, sometimes you'll have a person setting up a distraction, running a screen, and that still needs to have another person available to run the actual play for the game. Driving people uh, from one place to the next is important too. And they learned that their homes couldn't be out in the boonies. They need to be within the communities, within walking distances to businesses uh, to allow a person a little bit more independence. So the basic concept, you target a group of people with Prada Willie, you locate a building, determine how many rooms you need to have in a house, you find staff that are qualified, you train them even further, work on nutrition management, work on exercise and daily programs, coordinate work and school interventions and therapeutic interventions. Um, there are some companies within Germany that decided not to do a sheltered workshop. They instead offered a day program at the same place where a person will live. And the schools that children will go to are especially designed for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, there are still areas in Germany that are underserved. Uh, they have a, pre a prader willi Institute that is also setting up best practices. And you know, the, the goal, the vision is the same, whether it's in Germany and Denmark or the United States or elsewhere, specialized living and services, try to have low distances from families, apply research, exchange knowledge, and build up networking between companies and over borders so that we can all share these best practices together. So we're looking at Denmark and Germany doing things at a government model. Here in the States, we are a little bit less than that. You know, we're not as socialistic in terms of how healthcare is provided. So it's a lot more independent over here, but we can learn from these models of success uh, as to what we can do within our family structures or within our group homes here um, or within our residential facilities to provide good care. So that's gonna shift us to, oh, one more talk, I'm sorry. Um, Norbert also talked about the effect of COVID on the population of Prader Willi within the homes in Germany. And of, he only had eight infections within 75 people with Prader Willi syndrome. Most were asymptomatic, none with severe symptoms. Uh, the biggest challenges they had during the COVID time were, and you'll all be able to relate with us, um, changing information. It was stressful for a person with Prader Willi not to know what was gonna come day to day. The plans changed, the government rules changed. Uh, what they were allowed to do and not allowed to do changed every day. But over time, uh, when a person with Prader Willi sees that the changes in their life are the same as the changes in the lives of their Prader Willi caregivers or their families, it became less stressful. They adapted and they learned that it was okay to accept this change. And Sure, there's still a little, little bit of stress involved, but discussion and open communication saying, you know, it's not just for you, this is the same for us, we all have to follow these rules, it worked. 
Um, it was interesting that Norbert talked about greater stress in families who had their people with prior release syndromes in their own homes. These homes did, these personal homes did not have the same resources as Prada, as Prada Willie homes did. So families actually had more stress than the group homes did. And overall, we can all relate to the adding, adding the challenges of caring for somebody with Prada Willie in COVID, uh, in addition to our own health care and how we are concerned about how we were being affected by COVID. All those stresses came together. Okay, better shift gears. Um, I take a breath drink some more coffee, drink some more water, and go from there. Um, for the abstracts, we had 10 abstracts. They were all high quality. They were all scientifically based. And you can learn something from everybody that's talking with you. Uh, I learned from Dr. Bedard. Uh, she is a consultant, or she owns uh, Delta Behavior Services in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, she did a study um, during her PhD for uh, at the Arc of Al, Al Chihuahua, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, in Gainesville, looking at how a solid behavioral model can work with 45 people with prader willi syndrome. And the simple concept was a token economy. You can positively reinforce good behavior by giving somebody something. Uh, if you do something well, you get something. And you can use that later on. So it's a token economy for calories. And if you show good behavior, you get more. You don't lose something for bad behavior, but you get something for good behavior. And you have this differential reinforcement system of all other and alternate behaviors. You can work on tantrum de-escalation saying, well, if you do this, you get this. And it becomes a very solid structural model that can allow significant reductions in weight, decreases in food stealing, decreases in tantrum behavior. And really it's about expectation management. It's showing a person that in this environment, Here's what happens, and here are the rules. They're pretty straightforward. And if you get the frequency and type of positive reinforcers correct, you can make a huge difference. And we can all learn from this. And this is a model for success that we can incorporate in schools, in our homes, all the way along. And people with Prader Willi gain skills during these sessions, during this behavioral analysis program. They were able to learn how to promote good behavior. They were learned able to work and show skills. And they taught, they were able to learn for the long term. So this is a project that shows that with behavioral analysis and impacting a token economy on a group of people, whether it's a group of one or a group of 45, you can reinforce good behavior. So always think about the positive, not the negative. Um, Dr. Bolanovich uh, with uh, the Foundation of Prader Willi Research discussed some of the data from the Global Prader Willi Registry. This is something that FPWR put together, hosted by Nord uh, in 2015, and it's a global registry. And look at that email at the bottom. If you want info on how to register, um, go ahead and just shoot an email, and Jessica will respond and get you involved. For this study, uh, over the course of a couple of months in 2020, 350 families took part and just gave us information on how families were coping. We knew that caregivers felt more stressed because they had in increasing responsibilities for schooling and therapies and activities. 40% got less sleep, I know I did. Um, people with Prader Willi were affected by the loss of activities, you know, not being able to go to Special Olympics or not being able to go to school and changes in schedules were detrimental. Uh, and that can come out as a behavioral change. For some people, things were easier. Uh, families, some people were able to get more organized and do things. So these were not a predictable set of things that would come up with every family or with every school or with every group. Um, so, you know, some people were able to do super well. With, through the study, we learned that 45% of students were able to complete schoolwork that was usually done remotely without problems. And, you know, a small percentage actually enjoyed distant learning because they could control their environment a little bit better. And we learned that I was very pleased to see that 92% of families that needed medical care were able to get access to what they needed, whether it was prescription medications or Zoom services for online things or in-person in -person medical care. Okay, trials. Uh, three great trials came through these abstracts. And what I think the, the bottom line thing is that when we as parents and caregivers look at this data, you should look at how a study is set up. Is it a randomized study? Is it blinded? Is it placebo controlled? Is it multi-center? Is it a well-designed study to actually statistically show a difference? And this study was a phase two trial using a synthetic CBD oil. 
And Radius has a product that has no psychoactive contaminants. It has known dosing. So you know what you get per milliliter. And they wanted to see if this made a difference in hyperphagia related behavior and in body weight. They set up a well-designed trial, um, but then one of their sponsors was not able to provide funding. So the trial actually had to stop. So instead of enrolling 66 patients, they enrolled seven, only two completed the full 13 weeks. But when they looked at that data, and now realize this is very preliminary, it's not statistical, but it shows that there is a decrease that of hyperphagia scores when you're taking CBD, and is there a benefit in weight and BMI? So we need to look at this better, and Radius is committed to building a phase three trial uh, to better evaluate these questions in the near future. But it's early data that we can use, and I know many of our families are already using CBD products, but you know, I would caution you to look at this from a, a healthcare point of view, work with your primary care physician and your endocrine team and your psychiatry team when you're doing something like this to figure out what benefit will really be there. Uh, there was a case report that was fascinating of uh, a 10 year old boy in Nova Scotia uh, who presented with a sudden change in behavior. You know, one to three day spells of being mute and not showing normal behavior, hours to days of excitement, some psychotic uh, episodes, and then one a day, four piece of being normal, you know, what a normal 10 year old would do. And this was diagnosed as a cyclical catatonia. Um, you know, it affected his development. When you spend 80% of your time in a catatonic state and not responsive, you can see how you will not develop normally. So it was important to recognize the change, get a person plugged into the system. And Dr. Etches walked us through the different steps of how she was able to manage this and, and bring things to a, a much better condition. So first, cyclical catatonia is a symptom of something underlying. It can be seen in developmental disabilities, including autism spectrum disorder and prader willi and realize that any change needs an evaluation. Try to figure out what's going on because we can help. She started with medications to restore the imbalance between GABA and glutamate. GABA um, levels went down, glutamate levels went up. So you can use the medication to tune that up. But that only fixed the excited phase. There was still the catatonic phase that was there. She tried a short-term IV medication trial and was astounded by the response that after infusing a medication, um, this 10-year-old was able to become non-catatonic, normal in behavior, ask appropriate questions, but you can't keep that IV medication going for long. So she was able to effectively use electroconvulsive therapy with 80% to 90% resolution of symptoms. And this child no longer needs medications, does not need more ECT and is now doing much better. So just realize that there's a system out there that can help you. If you see something different in your young person with prader willi get that person in the system. Um, another uh, presentation from the FPWR database. Uh, this one is by Lisa Mat Matesevac. She is the study coordinator for the PATH study called Paving the Way for Advances in Treatments in Health. This is a, another patient reported outcome study. So the data is reported by patients in a registry. And we look at that data and say, is this worth studying more? And I think it is. She has a four-year study, study they'll be finishing up next year. So far has 600, over 600 respondents doing this with 93% completing surveys every six months. And what she wanted to talk about was serious medical events and how often they occur within our population of Prader Willi. And a third of people experienced at least one event. Uh, more than a third of that group, so a subset, had multiple events. And sometimes multiple events happen within a six month period. And the greatest number of events were these mental health events where we see changes that we need to assess and treat. Uh, nearly 20% were GI events, less than 10% were broken bones and sprains, uh, up to 6% were seizures. So these are changes in a person's normal baseline that affect everybody. She also tracked hyperphagia scores, looking at things by age group, and found that the hyperphagia scores increased as a person went from the 5 to 11 age group to the 12 to 17 age group to the 11 to 21 age group. I'm sorry, to the 18 plus age group. And it makes sense that your hyperphagia score is going to be higher when you have a higher BMI. But paradoxically, um, in increased food security environments, and she was looking at this with a, um, the study was called the food safe zone questionnaire. She was able to see that 
there was an increased hyperphagia score despite increased food security, which is paradoxical. So we have to look at that more. Um, and you know, of a lot of interest to uh, us as parents and as caregivers, uh, polypharmacy, taking more than one medication, clearly increases as our population with product really gets older. Uh, nearly 50% of the 18 and over age group is already taking more than one medication, and, and nearly 50% of that 18 plus age group is taking an antidepressant. So look at things and understand these medications and how they work for us. Um, Here's another study, the carbitocin study, that showed an effective response. Here's our second of two studies with a well-designed, randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blinded, multi-center trial that looked at a large number of people, 175 for the population, uh, looking for a primary endpoint of assessing change from baseline using these hyperphagia questionnaires. And you can see again that this would be dramatically affected by COVID. So if you stop the study at and look at the data set up to and before March 1st, you have 119 people. And she looking at the two different doses of intranasal carbitocin, uh, one dose was significantly better than the other. The 3.2 milligram dose was more effective in reducing hyperphagia. That same lower dose is statistically better on questionnaires. Um, and then on longer term follow-up, both doses showed meaningful improvements in all symptoms. So this is a very well-tolerated medication. You may see transient flushing. Um, and it's a nasal product, so you may see some nosebleed. Uh, Levotherapeutics is working with regulatory authorities to bring this product to patients. And we learned a lot by the dosing schedules that are coming through from how to best do this. This is what trials are for, to figure out what is the dose, what is safe, and what can we do going forward. Um, Jan Forrester talked about the different pharmacogenetic testing results. She talked about basically how we can use pharmacogenetic testing to evaluate the efficacy of medications that our, our population might take. And these are medications that affect a person's mental health. They are metabolized by the liver in different ways. And she wanted to look at uh, deletions versus UPD. Um, how do these drugs get metabolized? Are there differences? And can we use this information to choose the best medication to best treat a mental health issue? And there are a lot of confounding problems. There are comorbid conditions. There are other medications outside of the pharmaceuticals used for uh, psychiatric uh, disorders. We don't have a lot of medical evidence. We borrow from efficacy studies from other disabilities. And we see both benefits from these medications and side effects. And one thing she cautioned us about was, when you start a medication, you may see the side effect. You might start another medication to treat that side effect, and soon you're on multiple medications, right? So she looked at 30 patients in three centers and found that some patients with product really are more sensitive to psychotropic medications. And when you look at these different enzymes, um, I'm not sure why I have five when there are six that are supposed to be here, uh, but you know, a deletion may affect uh, processing of these medications in the liver more than a UPD. And we need to learn more about how can we use this information to tailor the right medication to the right person. So this is in the weeds. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these different enzymes. Um, it'll be on my uh, the PDF that you'll be able to download. Um, and this is available as well. But from Dr. Forrester's point of view, remember to start low, go slow, and try to make sure you're doing this in a coordinated fashion with your healthcare team. Uh, Dr. Miller talked about DC, DCCR um, and the another very well-designed, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial looking at 120 people. Um, this is a 13-week trial that showed efficacy. It was when you look at the data set and stop taking the questionnaires that were affected by COVID, we see DCCR caused, showed a clinically significant improvement in hyperphagia scores, you know, an impressive drop of seven points. Uh, is pretty improved, is a pretty significant change on these scores. Uh, caregiver questionnaire showed improvement, body fat decreased, lean body mass increased, uh, behavior indices improved, unexpectedly improving social and communication skills as well. So not just do we see this physiological benefit from DCCR with lower insulin levels, lower leptin levels, lower acetylated retinol levels, you can see increased HDL levels. You see increased adiponectin levels. These are all favorable responses of physiology. And this is that insulin system that we are affecting. And we know that if you're targeting something that's going to decrease insulin, 
you're going to have more sugar available. So your blood sugar will go up. There are some side effects. We have to watch out for that. And there's some side effects with increased body hair and lower extremity swelling. These are usually short-term effects, but you know, we kind of want to see how we can balance the benefit versus the risk. And it sounds like these are very low risk drugs. So DCCR is showing the potential to decrease hyperinsulinism. And we are heading into, in the United States, uh, of being a very obese country. And a lot of this is driven by insulin resistance and insulin efficient, insulin issues and diabetes, whether you're pre-diabetic or not. So weight control is all affected by this insulin system. And if we can make an effect that on insulin resistance, on dropping insulin levels and leptin levels, and also decreasing appetite, um, this is one of those medications that we need to bring to market. We're not sure when DCCR might become commercially available. Um, I think Seleno is still working on that. And you know, this is something that would be a benefit to our population as well. So on that line, behind the clinical scenes, we have bench research being done. And a lot of this is coming out of KUMC in Kansas City with Dr. Butler's team and Dr. Veach here reported on um, these ATP sensitive potassium channel gene variants. So DCCR um, is something that goes through and affects how um, potassium opens channels to allow things to flow across uh, cell membranes. And, and what Dr. Veach's team was able to look at was were different nucleotide variants in four genes and what the effect on an individual would be um, if they had a variation or no variation in these different genes regarding insulin levels and hyperphagia scores. And they found two patterns in fluing gene expression that were associated with increased insulin levels. And each of these groups responded better to DCCR. So if you can tease out the genetics, um, and granted, this study looked mostly at European ancestry. It was a lot more female than male. Um, so it was a, a subselected population. But we learned that you can find gene patterns to learn if a person is going to be predisposed to having a higher insulin level or not. And then to say, well, maybe that's a person that might need a drug like DTCR to say, well, we need to regulate those insulin levels and drop them because you are predisposed genetically to having a higher insulin level in your body. So these variants may influence how we're able to use medications like DCCR. Um, and we still have a ways to go, but it's, it's, a, it's a great bench correlation with what we're seeing clinically. So finishing up, um, our last slide is um, a, a neat study out of Ohio State where they now are two years into collecting data in their Prada Willy Clinic. And Dr. Michalak uh, reported on the different cognitive tools that they're using within their clinic to um, work with and make direct improvements in people's lives. So using cognitive tools like Stanford Binet, behavioral tools like the Child Behavior Checklist, and a social communication questionnaire, you know, his group found that on the cognitive side, his population was right where they expected to be for national averages for cognition. You know, IQ of about 70-ish or so is what we're seeing. And you can use these tools to make take the next step. If we see some place where we can improve, let's build a tool or make an, ad an adaption to a person's behavioral modification plan or their IEP to bring them up to the next level. On the behavior side, uh, we looked at uh, children ages six through 18, showing different behavioral issues. And we then have to address those issues and say, okay, we identify them. Let's find out if we can make an improvement. Let's reassess to see if we're making a difference. So these are tools that can at different time points, show us if we're making clinical progress. Um, he found a lot of overlap with the autism spectrum disorder population with the ASD population typically more impaired than the prader willi population. So again, that's information that we can use to manage our population to say, well, if there is a second diagnosis that we can take advantage of, and we have all this testing that shows we have things that we can make a difference in. Let's take advantage of that. So he provided one example. What do we do with this information? You know, he used it to provide a clinical evaluation to aid in a family that was pursuing guardianship. And if you have gone through that process, it's not easy. You need um, medical substantiation of a person's in incapacity to make decisions. And these tools in a structured fashion 
can be used to help make a difference and clinically guide a family or a person with Prader Willi through the next steps. So his team found that this can be done and you need space, you need time, you need sufficient manpower. Um, but with that sufficient manpower, these psychiatric and behavioral tools, these assessments, they can become as routine as checking your blood pressure and a weight. So if you go into clinic, you fill out a tool assessment, you kind of figure where you are on day to day with your behavioral analysis. Do we need to make a change here? Is it something that we can affect in your day to day routine? And you know, what can we do that is standard of care, highest best practice to make an impact to directly impact uh, the care of people provided? So, um, okay, I'm going to take a breath. Uh, have not stopped talking for a little bit. And uh, I, you know, it's just, it's amazing. We're we're getting so much detail and so much clinical data, and so much scientific uh, scientific validation of this data, that you know it, it's stuff to be optimistic for in the future. We have to be advocates for our people with Prader Willi syndrome. We have to be involved in research, support research, support our organizations, um, PWSA, FPWR. You know, let your money do the talking. If you're able to be politically involved, do that. You know, at a regulatory level, at an FDA level. You know, there are things that we may be able to make an impact on. Maybe we can get people to wake up and smell the coffee and and see that there are things that. Uh, like in Denmark, if you find an advocate in the government system that can make a difference and build a Prader Willi house, do it. You know, all politics is local, so start there. Make a difference in your own neighborhood. But if you have the ability, uh, get involved and make a difference uh, nationally as well. You know, become a volunteer. Be take your skill set and use it as you can, and figure out where you can uh, best make an impact. All right, I'm going to stop talking. Throw this back to Paige and Stacy and Mark. Um, I, I, if there are QA things that are popped up, I'd be happy to address them and we can see where we go. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Agarwal. Um, fantastic review, overview of two days, two full days of information. So um, we've received a lot of positive feedback already on your presentation today. So again, it will be, it is recorded, it will be available and uh, his slides will be available as well. So there are a couple questions. Um, Let's just start here. The first question, is there any data about COVID vaccine reactions for PWS individuals? Uh, not specifically, no. Uh, I think the population is too small. Um, anecdotally, I think we are seeing people being vaccinated without issues. Um, I have not heard of a case report. Um, if Jim or anyone from the, uh, the scientific advisory side are around, they may be able to communicate that a little bit more effectively. Um, it's interesting that the studies out of Europe are showing that there may be less effect, even if you're not vaccinated, uh, in our population of Prader Willi because of the lack of a segment of chromosome 15 that may actually protect you. So we've got bench research out of Kansas that is showing something similar. Um, you know, what we do now as a population has to be looked at with respect to Prader Willi and respect to a general population thing. Uh, I'll leave that up to each individual family. Um, but I don't know of anything adverse with vaccines with Prader Willi syndrome. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question Do you have any, uh, or do you know of any cases of multiple scler sclerosis in Prader Willi syndrome? I don't know. Question? Um, and again, I'm not a direct care provider. I'm just a dad. I just happen to do this radiology thing where I stick needles in people and drive catheters and wires around inside them uh, gadgets. So I'm playing video games inside people. Um, bounce that off your primary care provider. Um, if you uh, can shoot me a question via email, uh, my email is d agarwal, A-G-A-R-W-A-L, at I-U-P-U-I dot E-D-U. I'll repeat that. It's D-A-G-A-R-W-A-L at I-U-P-U-I dot E-D-U. I'll coordinate with our clinical advisory board and find out if there are resources out there. Perfect. Thank you. I know there are other um, cases where there are prader willi syndrome and other genetic disorders. Um, my son, for example, has prader willi syndrome and neurofibromatosis. And we know of three other cases um, that tie those, those two genetic disorders together. So um, but great question. And things are on a spectrum. And it, this is not an isolated thing. If you look at the probability of getting Prader-Willi syndrome versus the probability of getting autism, 
right? And it, we are a, a small fraction compared to that other population. So if you are able to, I mean, it's really important to develop a coordinated care plan to identify each separate diagnosis, then take advantage of the resources that are available for each. Great, great. Um, let's see, right now we don't have any other questions. Does anyone else have a question for Dr. Agarwal? We have, we have about five minutes left. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. So guys, I think take home points. Um, there's research going on every day. Uh, be involved. If you can uh, be a volunteer or be enroll into a study, please do so. Uh, I think it's important for our population to have good numbers uh, to to assess the effect of these medications. And you know, I'm not looking to get a side effect, but I think it's important to do these safety trials, and they're being run very safely uh, in a very coordinated fashion across the country and across the world. So as these studies become available. Um, you know, get involved, get enrolled. The registry is super important. Um, you can learn a lot. You get instant feedback on these surveys by putting your answers in and then you get feedback right back as to, well, what does the group think? And where do you fit into the spectrum of different things that are coming through? So be involved in your national organizations, be involved in your state organization um, and, you know, share information as you get it. You know, we're all resources. Uh, I, I clearly don't know everything. Uh, and, uh, I'm learning as I go, and I, I actually like the guys in Ohio State that said, you know, we're not sure what to do with this information, but we're using it, and we're learning about it, and we're taking that next step together as a group. Certainly an exciting time right now in PWS and research and everything that's going on, so great advice. Get involved where you can, and um, thank you again, Dr. Agarwal, for your um, amazing recap of everything in two days condensed down into an hour. So we, we appreciate that. Um, and please feel free to fill out your survey and join us at the next session. The next sessions are our, uh, breakout sessions and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody and thank you again. Thanks everyone, more great stuff to come.